Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Well, we have a very special video podcast today with Dr. Walt Laramore. He's one of CMDA's best known family doctors since 1994, who's been a frequent guest over several years on Christian Doctors Digest, the program that Dr. David Stevens, our CEO emeritus, hosted for many years. If you're not familiar with Dr. Walt, let me give you just a few background details before we get started. He is a prolific author and has written or co-written 40 books, as well as 30 medical textbook chapters and more than 1,100 articles in various medical journals and lay magazines. His books have garnered a number of national awards, including three gold medallion award nominations, as well as a book of the year award from ECPA. Well, here at CMDA, he's known for co-creating the saline solution as well as grace prescriptions. He's been a member of CMDA for nearly 50 years, with many of those as a lifetime member of CMDA. Well, I asked Dr. Walt to join me on the podcast this week to talk about his latest book, a completely different genre and topic for Walt, after years of publishing popular medical books. This new book is called At First Light, A True World War II Story of a Hero, His Bravery, and an Amazing Horse. I found this to be a powerful and true story, written by Walt and co-author Mike Yorkie, about Lieutenant Phil Larimore, who's Walt's dad, who graduated as the youngest officer ever from Officer Candidate School in Fort Benning, Georgia, at the age of only 17, in 1944. The Laramore family, including Walt, were completely unaware of the heroics of their dad until at a 50th wedding anniversary celebration, it opened up the floodgates of Phil's memories and the incredible stories finally began to be told. As we prepare for Memorial Day, this is a wonderful story, I think that will honor the heroes who served in World War II. And it comes from one of our own here within CMDA. I can't wait for you to hear more from Walt, so please keep watching. Oh, and if you're listening on your favorite podcast app, don't forget to visit cmda.org slash cmda matters to take a look at the video version of our conversation today. Well, today on CMDA Matters, it's a great privilege for me to welcome Dr. Walt Laramore, uh, who's been a longtime friend of CMDA, a prolific author, family physician, who's been involved in so many different media projects, written over 40 books, and got his start with CMDA at the beginning of uh, a good friend of mine's start, Dr. David Stevens. I think you told me last year you met Dave at the registration desk at a national convention, did you not? It was. It was the uh, then CMDS National Convention. It was in Dallas in 1994. Dave was coming in to interview for the, the, the position as national director, they called it then. And I was there. Uh, first time I'd ever come to uh, a CMDS convention to present the basics of what became the saline solution. And it was a funny story, Mike, because when they called, and Hal Habaker was the national director, and he called and said, I think some of our members would like to know how to share their faith, and you guys are doing it in your practice. I think we can probably get 25 folks together for a little seminar out of our attendees. I said, that's fine. <laughs> so I came, and when we were at the registration desk, Hal said, uh, boy, we goofed. He said, uh, uh, we didn't get the number right. And I said, well, if no one's showing up, that's fine. <laughs> you know? He said, no, he said, no everybody no, 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 everybody our... wants to come to your seminar. <laughs> out of yeah, That's right. Out of 500 attendees, there were 25 who didn't want to, to hear that. And so, uh, Mike, that's where Saline Solution uh, began, later became Grace Prescriptions, and now has morphed into this wonderful series of videos that CMDA is making available to its members and to others called uh, Faith Prescriptions. It's, it's 
just been a wonderful uh, venture. I guess now we're 22, 20, almost 30 years together working together on that. It's been a treat worldwide. It's made a huge difference, Walt. Um, and uh, many lives have been touched. And we're now in the second or if not third generation of those that you've trained who have now are training others to be able to share their faith and practice. And you regaled me with many stories of those early days trying to convince uh, the South Region director that it was that it was okay to stay in the United States and not become a missionary, but ac- actually share your faith with patients right here in the United States. But at the same time, your eyes really perked up and you got really excited telling me a story that you were preparing for what might be the most exciting writing project of your life. And that would be to write about what you discovered about your very own father, Phil Larimore. Tell us how in the world you discovered that your dad was somebody even more special than you even knew him to be all those years. You're the oldest of four boys. I am. I am. And, and you know, back in when I was a kid, uh, you know, in the 50s, uh, war movies and war stories and war heroes were all the thing. You know, in the neighborhood, we, we played uh, war games, if you would. And a lot of the boys talked about the roles their daddy had in the war. And I wanted to be able to brag about my daddy. You know, my daddy's better than your daddy or whatever. My brothers and I knew he had fought in the war. We knew he lost his leg, but he never talked about it. And we would ask mom, how come he won't talk about it? He said, he just doesn't want to talk about it. And he never did. And then on he and mom's 50th wedding anniversary, it was 1999. My brothers and I were gathered with, with mom and dad and a pastor where, where Barb and I were attending, asked me if I would preach that year, uh, July 4th was on a Sunday, if I would preach on why freedom isn't free. And so I used that uh, mom and dad's um, anniversary, which was in June, to sit down with my brothers and dad, and we just started asking some questions. And I don't know, Mike, if it was nostalgia, or he had gone to a couple reunions, and began to feel comfortable talking about things, but he opened up that night and told us some stories that, well, quite frankly, were just unbelievable. Uh, but yeah. but we loved hearing him and he loved telling him. And then uh, over the next four years before he passed away, he began opening up and telling stories. He was a Boy Scout leader. And so he told stories to the other leaders, to the boys, to folks he worked with. And even the unbelievable stories had a consistency to them. And that begins to make you think, well, maybe there's some truth there. He passed in 03, mama passed in 06. And when she passed, we found a military footlocker up in the attic, opened it up. It had his riding outfit. He, he was an equestrian. It had some of his uniform and it had over 450 letters that he had written to his mom and, and to a girlfriend and to his dad and to best friends. And I was just stunned at, at the, the the depth of emotion in those letters, the battles that he described, the, 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 the difficulties, the suffering, the sacrifice that he went through. And as we were beginning to actually go through the letters, got a call from the from the Pentagon. And it was a general at the Pentagon saying, uh, we understand that your, your dad has passed away and he has a special area in Arlington reserved for him. And, why does he have a special area? And he said, well, don't you know? Don't you know how famous he is and what he did? And I, I didn't. We knew he had a shadow box with medals in his office. We knew that he had pictures signed by generals saying, to a fighting man and to the best soldier I commanded. But as we began to dig through the history books, we found that the stories he told were documented in history. And as I went to the National Archives, I found that the stories he told were documented there, even down to some court transcripts for a, a battle that he fought that we can talk about later. But anyway, started putting these together in a document just for my brothers and I, and it grew to 1.5 million <laughs> words, I mean, just because of the documentation of all the battles and and everything that happened in, in Europe. And I, I have a writers group that I was meeting with, and one of the writers, our, our members and listeners will know of Jerry Jenkins, and began telling Jerry that I thought maybe this would be a nice novel to write. And Jerry said, well, Walt, a novel to be successful, a novel has to be believable. But a nonfiction book to be successful has to be unbelievable. And your dad's story in this record it's unbelievable. So make it nonfiction. And so 16 years of work started in 2006. And 
the book has just come out finally after all this time. Congratulations. And your co-author, Mike Yorkey, is someone you've worked with in the past uh, to publish at least one of your 40 books. Is that right? Yeah. Mike and I worked on the book, uh, 10 Essentials of Highly Healthy Teens, a book for teen mothers. And uh, I have written another 40 or so books myself. But this book was rejected and rejected and rejected. There were uh, 48 rejections for it. In fact, <laughs> wow. one... The, the editor from St. Martin's Press uh, wrote back and said, you know, I th I th you've written 40 books. I thought you would know how to write. <laughs> and uh, I guess I didn't, for this genre, didn't know how to write. And so after the 48 failures, a mutual friend of Mike's and I said, well, you know, Mike's doing World War II books now. How about having him take a look at it? And so I called Mike and he was willing to join the project. And he said, tell you what, Walt. Why don't you send me the first well, – no, he said, send me the manuscript. Let me read it and see if it's even something I want to do. And he read it in about a week, and he called me back, and he said, there's clearly a story here, Walt, but what you've done, you've hidden your daddy's story. You're telling the stories of other men. You're telling the stories of the battle, but you've hidden his story. And I think what I would like to do – he said, I understand why you did. I understand you don't – I understand that you want to lift up all of these men who have been forgotten, that fought on the Southern Front, fought in Africa and Italy and Southern France, and they've completely been forgotten. Nobody knows that they did five D-Days and the guys up north did one. Nobody knows that they liberated the first capital of Europe, Rome, a couple of months before Paris was liberated. You know, no one knows that they had much more difficult battle of the bulge, a much more difficult forest battle. Nobody knows that. And you've, you've hidden your daddy's story. So he said, let me just take five chapters and take a stab at it and see what you think. And so in a few days, he returned five chapters. And I didn't even, I just had worked so hard on the book for so long. I didn't even want to read what he did. But I had Barb, my wife, read. And uh, after a little bit, uh, I walked into the room where she was reading. And she had tears coming down her cheeks. And I thought, I guess it's not that good. <laughs> I said, what's the matter with it? And she said, honey, it's beautiful. He's put the icing on this cake, and he has uncovered your daddy. So once Mike and I finished working on it, he was so such a good author. Uh, we sent him out, and we had three, three offers from three publishers within three days, and, and then the book finally came out. Well, for our listeners, the book's title, At First Light, A True World War II Story of a Hero, his bravery, and an amazing horse. And I shared with you, just as we got going, all I could think of as I'm reading through this book, and I couldn't put it down. It really, I can see why 2020 Page Turner Award, you were a finalist. I couldn't put it down. Burned a lot of midnight oil in the last 10 days, reading nearly 500 pages. And one of my daughters said, how did you fit in 500 pages of reading, Dad? You got too much going on. And I said, not this book, not this book. A genre that many of our listeners will appreciate, like, like uh, you have shared with me, reading stories of heroism at a time like this in our country, approaching Memorial Day. It was very moving. I wonder, Walt, how many times that you were sitting in archives, uh, military archives and libraries at Fort Benning, all over the place, D.C., that when you read about what your dad had done or what he was involved with, that it was an emotional moment. How often did that happen in the process? The archives that are available, now at World War II archives, a significant portion of them burned in a, in a fire in St. Louis. And after that, the archives were distributed around, around the country. The 3rd Infantry Division, which was the main division that fought on the Southern Front, the Northern Front guys, I, Mike, the Southern Front guys had a big chip on their shoulder because of the Northern Front guys. You know, when you think of D-Day, you only think of, of their D-Day. And those guys said, we had five of them. The 3rd Infantry Division actually had seven seven D-Days. Uh, the Northern Front guys fought from June 6th to May 8th, about 336 days. The Southern Front guys fought 913 days. They had the most casualties of any of the 90 divisions that fought in World War II. They had the most Medal of Honors awarded to any division. They had the most Medals of Valor. They had the most deaths. In fact, they had almost 40,000 
casualties. The, the war that they fought, the suffering, the sacrifice was stunning. And when you read the field reports that were written every day by platoon leaders and squad leaders and then company commanders and then commanders of battalions, and you see what they went through, the losses that they had, it is just stunning. And how do you tell a, a thousand day story, you know, in a small book? But Dad was on the front line. He was the youngest uh, frontline officer in World War II. He was the youngest commission officer. He was the youngest graduate from officer candidate school. Does that record still stand, Walt? Is he still the youngest ever? As far as I know, like, for example, officer candidate school in the Army, usually can't get in it unless you're an ROTC grad and a college grad. And he had just finished high school. Now, he finished high school at a military academy because he was a, a ruffian and a hoodlum and a juvenile delinquent who just didn't like school. He had a mom worked as a legal secretary. His dad worked as a conductor. And so he was a latch key type child. So finally, his parents just in frustration sent him to military school. And he was like a duck in water. He loved military school. So he graduated from military school at age 17, went straight to OCS because the war had begun, graduated from OCS when he was 17, and then had to wait a couple of weeks till his 18th birthday to get his commission as a, as a second lieutenant. But then after his training, he went straight to Anzio, straight to the front line, and actually he was in charge of what was called an A&P platoon, ammunition and pioneer platoon. He and his guys worked all night to deliver ammunition to the front line to set mines up in no, no man's land, to defuse mines in no man's land, to set wire up. I mean, literally within 10, 20, 30 yards of the enemy. And he was a frontline officer for for over 15 months. And his stories are, are chilling. Anyone who's not read frontline stories or anyone who has, one of our, the reviewers of the book said, it's kind of like a combination of Unbroken and Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. And because of the horse stories, he's just kind of like War Horse and, and Sea Biscuit. But to actually find the, for example, when he <clears throat> lost his leg, Mike, to find that radio transmission that was actually recorded as an amputee, he fought to let amputees stay in the Army. Then the Army had a policy saying, if you're an amputee officer, you're not hu human. I mean, policy didn't say that, but the attitude was, you're not complete, you're disabled. You're, you're just a cripple. You're, you're a cripple, he was called that. And I actually found the transcript of his, of his court fight to keep officers in the Army. And it, it reminded me of A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, that riveting court scene. Here I'm reading my dad in the middle of one of those riveting court scenes. Found that in the archives. I'm so grateful to the archivists of this country, uh, the archives in Paris, France, the archives uh, in Rome and Anzio, and the archives spread around this country are stunning. If any of our viewers or listeners are interested in going back and finding out what their dads and what their moms who served in the military did, our archives are stunning. Why do you think your dad kept quiet? Was it his humility? Was it there were just painful stories to recall? I mean, all those years, did he actually spend much time with his war buddies over the years? No, he didn't, and many didn't. Most didn't. This was a common story. In fact, I just got a, a letter this morning from the director of a veterans organization who just finished the book. She was really kind. She said, it's the best World War II book that I've ever read. But she said, my guys don't like talking about this. And I hope one of the things that'll come from the book is that men will begin to talk. But Mike, I think the war was so horrible. Dad talked later about the, the smells that were tattooed into his nose. And he had dreams, nightmares that lasted for decades. And as he began to age and those dreams began to go away, those smells began to go away, that was the first time he could open up and talk about it because before talking about it actually brought in more dreams. In fact, I was gonna take him to see Saving Private Ryan. And uh, he said, Walt, I, I can't go with you. And I said, why not? And he said, well, I've talked to buddies who've gone and they said that the sounds of the bullets hitting the bodies and going overhead is exactly what we heard. He said, the dreams have gone away. I don't want them to come back. So one thing, that was one reason. The second reason was, they had gone over, you know, for adventure and to, they, they said to kick the heil out of Hitler, you know, and young men, boys, teenagers, 
uh, going over for adventure and heroism. And then when they got there and got into the battle, that went away. And they began to fight for each other, Mm -hmm. to save each other and to protect each other and to get back home to their parents and to their girlfriends. And that was what they fought for. And when they won that war, they came back and they wanted to live the freedom that they had preserved. They wanted to leave the war behind, and they became loyal to their jobs. All of the men dead fought with stayed in one job for life, and they were successful at that. All of them except one stayed in the same marriage for, for life. They were devoted to their careers, to their wives, to their kids, and to their faith, because if they went to that war without a spiritual faith, they came back with one. I marvel at the way you weaved various themes throughout the book. Uh, The equestrian theme, of course, your father an equestrian and trained mules, how to deliver munitions to the front lines in the midst of mud and difficult vehicles would not have passed. And so, and uh, Phil Larimore really rose to the top. He, He had the attention of the commanding officers of the company of the regiment. And in fact, when he was finally hit by a a German dum-dum bullet in his knee, which eventually resulted in him losing his leg. It, it was one of his commanding officers who, when he heard, I, I was just, I was there. I was like, that commanding officer, I love this soldier. He is just my kind. And went into danger to try to find your dad, who was buried beneath other bodies. He had been injured and had hidden himself to avoid being killed. Yeah, that was exactly exactly four weeks before the end of the war. And Colonel McCarr, who's one of the few battle commanders who didn't ever write a biography, was beloved by his men. He was one of the most awarded battlefield commanders. Uh, I mean, Dad had a Distinguished Service Cross and two Silver Stars and two Bronze Stars. Those are, after the Medal of Honor, the three highest valor awards they have. I think Colonel McGar had three Distinguished Service Crosses, four or five silver stars, because he would get out with the men. It was not at all unusual. And Mike, you read about a number of battles where the guys would be on the front line, and he would come up there and, and be with them. Uh, and, and as Dad would say, he would put his boot you know, where the, the sun doesn't shine to get his, get his men to move. But he was an equestrian, and the general who commanded the division was an equestrian. They knew dad was an equestrian. And so his biggest equestrian, I think probably the two biggest equestrian things he accomplished, one was he was sent in on a secret mission a few days before he lost his leg to find the Lipizzans that Hitler had sequestered into Czechoslovakia to document that they were there. They were in grave danger. The Russian army was coming towards the horse farm where the Lipizzans were being sequestered and likely would have killed and eaten them. And the reason we know that is just a few weeks before that, the Russians had captured a trailer of just over 20 Lipizzans that were being taken to this horse horn for safety. And they killed and ate at least 18 of them. And so the Germans were concerned, the German vets were concerned about the Lipizzans being lost as a horse breed. And so dad was sent in on a secret mission to discover them and then find them. And then as you know, later in the book, as a result of that, the book ends with an amazing horse story. That we don't we want to have any spoilers here we, today for our listeners or viewers. We won't give away, but yeah, the, the equestrian part that we threw there is amazing. The, the forgotten battles of the Southern Front are stunning and amazing. The other equestrian thing he did was, because he did lose his leg, came back to rehab. It was about a year of rehab at Lawson General Hospital, Atlanta. And then he stayed in the Army to fight for amputee officers, that they could stay in the Army. That fight took place at Fort Myers, which is in Washington. His best friend from the war, Ross Calvert, was there leading the platoon of soldiers who guard the Tomb of the Unknowns. Colonel McGar was there as the commander of Fort Myers. Eisenhower, with whom Dad had had a friendship, was there now as the chief of the Army, of a four-star a general, and then uh, General Young that he had fought with was there. So these guys all brought him to Fort Myer so that he could fight his battle to let amputee officers stay in. But it was there that he only had one leg. And in the caisson platoon, these are the guys who, who carry the, the caskets to Arlington. There's eight horses, so there's six of them that pull the caisson. 
For colonels and above, there's a horse that walks behind the caisson. That's the empty saddle horse with the boots. And then the commander has a horse. And the commander and the guys riding on the caisson horses cannot move. They're frozen in position. So how do the horses know to move? Well, the men will move a knee or an ankle or a foot almost imperceptibly to tell the horses what to do. Well, dad only had one leg Mm -hmm. and the horses were trained to a two leg lead. So as far as we know, he's the first equestrian to ever train a horse to a one leg lead. And it's just, it was just another example of an amazing man and a truly amazing story. You would have lunches with Harry S. Truman at the White House after he got back after the war and played bridge with Dwight D. Eisenhower. And I was really touched, Walt, by the conversation. I wonder how much you had to add or was that actually documented, the very special, very intimate conversation that Dwight D. Eisenhower had with your dad as he's being ready to be airlifted back to the U.S. for further rehab. Most of the conversations in the book are fictionalized because conversations have to be. Now, the the trial transcripts, that's, you know, that's there, word, you know, word for word. But Dad uh, provided so much of that information by telling stories. The uh, Dear John letter that he got that came from his from his stories. Discussions with Eisenhower, with Truman, came from his stories, but not just his stories. I found his uh, the children of his best friend, Ross Calvert, they had the same stories. And so we were able to share stories and conversations. Uh, Ross Calvert, who was my dad's best friend, was a junior. Ross Calvert the third, the fourth, and the fifth are alive. But Ross Calvert the third and I would exchange letters and exchange stories. And Ross would say, no, my, my dad wouldn't say it that way. He would say it this way. And this is how my dad said your dad said it. So that was really helpful and instrumental. I had the children of about a dozen men that dad fought with that were able to chip in and and share how their dads would have said different things. And so what we tried to do was reconstruct language exactly as it would have been back then. Doing that avoids some political correctness. The men back then talked about Negroes. They didn't talk about black people. They didn't talk about African-Americans. And so we used the terms that they used. Dad was raised in a a racist environment in Memphis, but his first assignment was to an African-American platoon of what he called Negroes. And he fell in love with those men, with their love of the country, with their love of the Lord, with their love of service, their love of discipline. And it was his first assignment, actually, before he went overseas, was to, to be in charge of a Negro platoon. But it was there that he began to learn the value of diversity and the value of men from different backgrounds being able to serve together on a team more effectively together than they ever would be apart. Actually, when he finished college and his master's degree at University of Virginia, he went to LSU to do his doctoral studies. And uh, we were recently there for the world premiere of the book. And one of his colleagues told me, I knew that dad had African-Americans that worked with him, but one of his colleagues told me that dad was the first white faculty member at LSU to hire blacks on his staff because of what he had learned in World War II. Wow. The greatest generation was a very religious generation. There's a lot of faith that goes through the book. And also, you wanted to be sure to tell our listeners, this is not the average, usual Walt Laramore book. There are a a few words that you've never used before in a book. You want to just tell our listeners about that? Yeah, there's a disclaimer at the front of the book that, you know, the language is salty. This is front line men in the middle of battle. And so there's four letter words that are used. They're not gratuitous. They're always used in language uh, and they're not common. They're peppered throughout the book. Those men had a, a freedom, if you would, of violating the third commandment. I didn't feel that I had that freedom. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't cross that line. I I wouldn't violate that. But there is some language used. And yet, even with that, the number of well-known Christians who were able to endorse the book, you know, Jerry Jenkins and then Coach Joe Gibbs and 
Coach Mike Krzyzewski and Coach Dan Reeves, wonderful Christian football coach and Super Bowl player, actually read this book on his deathbed. I didn't know that at the time wow. and, and endorsed the book. But uh, Bill Boykin, who uh, serves with Tony Perkins at the Family Research Council, wrote a wonderful endorsement. Trish Goyer, a Christian author that many of our listeners know. And so to have people who understand language, who understand evangelical Christianity say, I can endorse this book, The Language is Not Gratuitous, was really meaningful for me. Well, I have to ask you this question because one of the most remarkable stories you tell as I faith woven through your grandparents were churchgoers, prayers as far as I could tell for your dad and the, the moment that your father was shot in the leg, uh, the story you tell is that your mom knew it instantaneously that she was in church and it hit her something had just happened to your dad did it happen yeah, yeah it was his dad his mom and dad uh, they they raised him in a Methodist church, uh, sent him to Sunday school, sent him to vacation Bible school, really didn't help his delinquent att- attitude. The thing that helped him the most was actually taking care of horses that pulled the trolleys in Memphis. But they were worshiping on a Sunday morning, April 8th of 1945, this is a month before the end of the war, and she heard a shot. During the service, she heard a shot, and she knew instantly, her story was, she knew instantly that dad had been shot. And she actually ran out of the service. My granddad was alarmed and went out after her and found her in the foyer sobbing. And she said, Junior's been shot. And then they found out uh, three days later with the telegram that he had had a, uh, a wound that cost him uh, his leg, but th- that, that she knew. That actually is not a rare story among these blue star moms and even the gold star moms. The difference, the gold star moms were those who had lost a son or a daughter in the war. The blue star had, had one that was fighting in the war. And as she interacted with other moms of wounded veterans, she found that that wasn't a rare story. I had never, I never had heard that before, but I thought it was important to include it in the book. Uh, you were talking about the faith of the men. Records show that there were virtually no atheists or agnostics. The old saying, Dad would say, there's no atheists in the foxhole, was true, that men who came over there lukewarm about their faith uh, didn't get very far on the battlefield before their faith began to grow. Before battles, the priests would have increased confessions, the pastors would have increased conversions, baptisms would go up. And these weren't, at least according to the chaplains I interviewed, these weren't just sort of insurance policies. These were men that were truly converted, who truly gave their life to the Lord. Now, I didn't see Dad's faith play its way out. Barb and I, I, let me explain this. Barb and I came to Christ in college through the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. And so we were used to singing certain songs, and we were used to sharing the four spiritual laws, and we were used to faith being manifested in a particular way, and Dad and Mom didn't manifest that way. And so I really questioned. In fact, one night I sat down with Dad and questioned whether he was truly a Christian. It really took him back. I think it hurt his feelings. And then he began to explain to me what happened in the battlefield and how men prayed together and how they sang hymns together and how even on the battlefield, whenever they could get to a church, even if it was a bombed out, almost destroyed church, they would go to church together. And, uh, he pulled out of his wallet. I, I actually keep it here on my on my computer. He pulled out of his wallet. He said, Walt, this is the poem that I used as, as my prayer every night that I was on the battlefield. And they handed it to me, and he, he quoted this from me- memory. He said, no shell or bomb can on me burst, except my God permit it first. Then let my heart be kept in peace, his watchful care will never cease. No bomb above nor mine below need cause my heart one pang of woe. The Lord of hosts encircles me. He is the Lord of earth and sea. And I still get goosebumps. He taught me that that spiritual faith, a true relationship with God through the, the sacrifice of Jesus is manifested by being controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit in such a way that 
your faith comes out in your words. It comes out in your service. It comes out in your actions. And so his faith was a faith of loving God, loving and being loyal to his wife, loving and being loyal and disciplining his boys, and then being loyal to his faith by being excellent in his career and becoming one of the best known map makers, cartographers in the world at the time he lived. He would say, Walt, you don't wear your faith on your sleeve. You show it in service and you show it in love. And as I look back on our veterans, that's what most of them did. Seems a, a principle in the Old and New Testaments that we serve a God who wants us to remember. And it's by remembering, uh, working against this chronological snobbery that C.S. Lewis talked about, but remembering that we can go back to some things that were really special about the previous generations. Thanks for challenging us this month of May as we work toward uh, look toward Memorial Day 2022 for remembering some giants who preserved our freedom for us and Europe and the world, really, from some very evil people. For all of us on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, instead of just thinking about hamburgers and hot dogs and wonderful time with family, to find stories that we can revisit, whether it's the Vietnam War or more recent wars or Afghanistan, but to find veteran stories and be able to honor them by reading some of those stories. They don't have to be long, but reading those stories to our kids and grandkids and teaching them, Mike, just as you said, to remember. Well, you heard me share with Walt how I just couldn't put down his book when I started reading it. As you celebrate Memorial Day soon, I hope you'll take a few moments out of your busy schedule to remember and honor our military heroes, heroes just like Phil Larimore. And if you want to read this incredible story, you can get your copy of At First Light on Amazon or at most other booksellers. And if you'd like to hear more from Dr. Walt, be sure to visit his website at drwalt.com. You can also find other books by Walt, including the Natural Medicine Handbook, in our CMDA bookstore at cmda.org slash bookstore. You know, Walt is so well known around CMDA for his incredible work with Dr. Bill Peel in developing the original saline solution as well as Grace Prescriptions materials. Through that program, he's helped train thousands of healthcare professionals to be salt and light in this dark world. We know that witnessing to Christ's work in your life is not an option. It's an imperative. And in the book of Acts, Christ's final command before he ascended into heaven was that his disciples will be my witnesses. Pointing people to Christ is certainly our mandate but it is also an incredible opportunity. Those of us who serve in healthcare have the best opportunities to point individuals toward the Lord Jesus. One of our big priorities here at CMDA is to help train healthcare professionals to integrate their faith into their practice of healthcare. Because of this legacy that Walt and Bill gave us through the Saline Solution and Grace Prescriptions, we have released faith prescriptions the third iteration of this powerful program. This on-demand video series will teach you to share your faith in ethical and appropriate ways with your colleagues and patients. It will teach you to pray with patients and much, much more. To get started with the series, which is free to our CMDA members, just visit the CMDA Learning Center at cmda.org learning. Ladies, we want you to know you're invited to join Women Physicians and Dentists in Christ at their 2022 annual conference, September 15th through the 18th in beautiful Newport Beach, California. Their theme this year is from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, which says, Come to me, Jesus said, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Workshop topics will include burnout, setting your boundaries, sleep and well-being, dementia, dealing with difficult patients, end-of-life care, importance of exercise and rest, trusting God, prayer life. Wow, there's so many more topics. 
Student scholarships are available for currently enrolled medical and dental students. And actually this year, there'll be a men's track available for those whose husbands want to come and be with them. So please join the ladies of WPDC for a weekend of fun, fellowship, and worship as you find rest in our Savior. If you'd like more information and to register, just visit cmda.org slash WPDC. I want to take a moment now to say thank you to those of you who've already responded to our big announcement just a few weeks ago. If you happen to miss it, a small but highly committed group of our ministry partners provided your CMDA with an incredible $320,000 matching gift offer. If you haven't responded yet, it is not too late. And we still have a ways to go to claim that entire $320,000 match by June 30th, the end of our fiscal year. Thank you in advance for considering your most generous gift today. If our stewardship department can answer any questions or assist you in any way, you can give them a call, 888-230-2637, or email them, stewardship at cmda.org today. To give online, you can visit cmda.org slash give. Near the beginning of this week's episode, you heard me mention that Dr. Walt is a lifetime member of CMDA. A lifetime membership to CMDA offers extensive benefits to you, as well as helps to ensure that the important work being done for healthcare continues far into CMDA's future. It provides a lifetime of opportunity and a lifetime of change. You know, you never have to worry about a dues increase again as you lock in today's rate and you'll never again have to pay annual dues. Plus you save time spent on repetitive check writing. In addition, you experience the satisfaction of providing funding for long-term life-changing ministries. For more information, you can contact CMDA's member services at memberservices at cmda.org or visit cmda.org slash lifetime. Well, I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Walt Larimore. His story about his dad to me is captivating. If you haven't had a chance yet, don't forget to check out our special video version this week. There's a link in your show notes, or you can visit cmda.org slash cmda matters. For decades, Dr. Walt Larimore has been using the skills that God has obviously given to him to share his faith with his patients. And perhaps even more importantly, he's been using those skills to teach others just like me and many others to do the same. As you learn how to do that through faith prescriptions and as you share God's love through healthcare, you are bringing the hope and healing of Christ to our world. That's what matters most to CMDA and CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.